Well, all the proceeds of that will go into our women's ministry as well. We're excited. One night is coming up next month. We're going to have this, but 3,000, 3,500 women across four nights all across Acadiana. Ladies, are you excited about that? Well, as uh, Pastor Joseph shared, Friday night, Good Friday service, a communion service. It's 45 minutes long. It's not the Easter service. I actually explained to you about Good Friday, what it is, the Passover meal, which was what we call the Last Supper. I'm going to take you in a brief history, literally from Genesis all the way through to the night where Jesus sat with his disciples. And so that's Friday night at 5 o'clock. That's the only one service that's going to be here, so get here early. And then the regular Easter services will begin on Saturday. And Mom, I, I know that your children are going to call and go, Mom, what, what do you want me to do? What, 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 what do you want to do for Easter? What are we doing for Easter? What are you going to say? Come to church. Come to church. Come to church. And you get them here, and I promise you we will present the gospel to them uh, for God to do some great things in their life. Well, we're welcoming right now our Abbeville campus and Midtown are joining us. Would you give them a big hand? <clears throat> Have you ever noticed that God answers prayers in ways and at times we never would? There was a very famous uh, pastor in our community who actually began many of the non-denominational and spirit-filled churches here he began in the 40s on South College Street. His name was Bob King, and, and the church was named First Assembly. I preached there many, many times in the late 70s and, and, and 80s. And he had a famous saying, and it went like this, God is never late. And then he would say, but he sure misses a lot of opportunities to be early. <laughs> how, how many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you know that God not only answers prayers in different ways in times than we would, but, but God often uses people in circumstances we never would? How many ever argued with God about some of the people he was using? But I want to give you a news flash. <laughs> That's why he's God and we're not. That's why he's God and we're not. I want to begin today's message right where we left off last week. We're actually beginning with the last six days of the life of Jesus on earth before he is to be crucified. We began three weeks ago talking about how Mary came and, and how she poured out a year's worth of perfume, ointment. Usually it was saved for a special occasion or someone dying. They would anoint their, their body with it after they embalmed them. But John goes to the trouble of telling us that she takes this oil and she pours it all over his head. Another gospel writer says on his feet. And, and she does all of this. And it begins to do things to people that are watching. So let's pick up the story today. John chapter 12, verse 1. Six days before the... Okay, remember, that's going to be Friday night. We're going to talk about all that. Saturday, therefore, uh, Jesus, therefore, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had... Raised from the dead. How many of you know that if there could have been a bunch of Lazaruses in Bethany, but if you were the Lazarus that got raised from the dead, that might give you a little different distinction? Okay, just wanted to be sure. So they gave a dinner for him there, and Martha, who is Lazarus' sister, served, and Lazarus is one of those reclining at the table. Mary, therefore, took a pound of expensive ointment and made a pure nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with fragrance of perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, who he, who he would betray him. Now remember, John is writing his gospel not as it happens. He's writing it after it happened, now looking back on everything. And he said, Judas did, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And he said, this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. And Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Now, again, they have no clue of what's going on. For the poor you have with you, but you do not always have me. And when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on the account of him, but they also wanted to see Lazarus, whom he has raised from the dead. 
So the chief priests made plans to put to they wanted to kill who? Lazarus, okay? Because on account of him, many Jews were going away from Judaism and believing in Jesus. And the next day, a large crowd had come to the feast and heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of, this is where we get Palm Sunday. They took palm tree limbs and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna. even the king of Israel. And when Jesus found a young donkey, he sat on it as it is written. And when you hear those words, it's always a quote of the Old Testament. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. But his disciples did not understand these things. And when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been written about him and what he had done. The crowd Verse 17, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, looking at all these people, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world is coming after Jesus. Now, isn't this an interesting story? How many of you would like to be a part of this parade? They leave a meal where he's being celebrated, where they don't realize it, but Mary is taking and she's pouring ointment all over him. Jesus knows it's because he's soon going to be killed. And just like they would put ointment all over somebody's body after they were dead and embalmed, he's saying, she's doing this in advance for my burial. You were here a couple of weeks ago, you heard me say that many Bible scholars say that perfume, that smell on him was so strong that even when he went to the cross, you could probably still smell it on him. And now it's turned from a dinner a while later into a parade, a Mardi Gras parade. And you know who the king of the Mardi Gras parade is? Yeah, and this one is Jesus. It's not, it's, I'm not being, you, you know. It, if you got a religious spirit, get over it. All right, no. So it's now Jesus. He's the head of the parade, and he's riding on a little colt of a donkey, and people are just cheering, and they're throwing things in front of him. And beside him is probably also from the dinner, the guy who'd been healed of leprosy. Simon the leper, he's walking beside him. Beside him also is Lazarus. And so people are lined up all along the way. And here's a guy that's been raised from the dead. Here's the son of God. Here's a guy that's been healed of leprosy and others. And they're all just cheering as Jesus and his crew go along. Mary, Martha, they're all there. What a parade. And then we hear what the religious leaders are thinking. Now, how many of you know sin will make you stupid? Let me say that one more time. How many of you know well, sin will make you stupid? Okay. How many people here are over 30? How many of you are thankful they didn't have cell phones with cameras on when you were in junior high and high school and college? Can you imagine that? Your grandchildren come up, Mama, that's you? What were you wearing? What is a halter top? And imagine if they could go back and tape you, you know, at the keg. Come on, at Cowboys? At La Fonda's on a long Friday night? And, and imagine if they could, how many of you are grateful they didn't have phones back then so that can't be recorded? You know why? Because sin will make you, sin will make you stupid. L look at what sin has done and the stupidity. I, I mean, I'd like to ask the characters involved in this story, I'd like to each ask them a question. Like, like let's start here with the Jewish leaders. Like, why do you want to kill someone who only heals, forgives of sin, and removes its power of fear and guilt and shame? They don't say it anymore, but when I was a kid, some of you remember when you did something wrong, 
older people would look at you and they'd go, what would they say? Remember when they used to say that? People don't do that anymore. You know why? Because people don't have any shame anymore. Everybody went to counseling to get rid of shame. There's some stuff you should be ashamed of. You know, it's kind of, people walk up and, you know, they, I mean, they, they just act like, you know, just I got a little problem. A guy was standing in line one day and, and, and you know, people are standing in line. He said, well, could, could I pray for you? And the guy goes, yeah. He goes, well, well what's your problem? He says to the guy, my friend says, what's your problem? The guy says, well, you know, I just need to get closer to God. He goes, like, what's the real problem? He goes, well, I got some sin in my life. He goes, okay, just tell me what the real problem is. He goes, I'm a drug dealer. <laughs> I mean, there's some things you need to be ashamed of. You ever, you ever heard this statement? They have no shame. They used to say shame on you. Today we say they have no shame. And so I, I would want to I would want to ask them like, why would you, why would you want to kill someone who every time he comes in contact with someone, their life gets better? Blind people see. He ruined every funeral he was invited to. I mean. Air, lepers, okay, if you're in any storm, he can calm those too. Why would you want to kill someone who's just doing good for everyone? Here's the second person I'd like to ask. I'd like to ask Judas. Did you really think you were stealing from Jesus and he didn't know it? I mean, the one that walked up to people and told them who they were and what their names was and where they were from before they even said anything. Because he, did you really think that you could deceive Jesus? Like, remember when y'all were fishing all night and couldn't catch anything and he pulled in the whole load? Or, or remember when he calmed the sea? Or remember the time when he came walking on water? Did you think you could fool that Jesus? Here's the third group I'd like to ask, the religious leaders, that was the Pharisees. They were, to put it in a, in a Catholic context, they would have been the cardinals. To put it in a Protestant context, they would have been the key religious leaders of their day. To the Pharisees, the religious leaders, I want to ask them, did you really think you could kill Lazarus? Like, how are you going to kill somebody that's already been raised from the dead once? Like, what would make you want to kill somebody who could testify against you in court? He killed him. How do you know? Our next witness we call to the stand. You don't need a lineup. It was him. Did you really think that you could kill someone who'd already been raised from the... Think of the stupidity of that. And then did you really think you could kill someone who'd already raised somebody from the dead? But sin will make you stupid, won't you? Well, why, why, did they, why did they do that? Well, the, the truth is it's, it's, it's simple and it's sad. The reason they did that is because of fear and pride and insecurity. Fear and and most of the stupid stuff we've done in our life, most of the sinful things we've done in our life, we did out of fear or pride or insecurity. Look back at some of the lies you've told, some of the things you've done, trying to cover up fear and pride and insecurity. But the truth is, as sad as all of this is, the Jews had been praying for years for someone to come to deliver them. Who were they praying for? The Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah. They were praying for the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world to come. They'd been under Roman rule for hundreds of years and they thought that the Messiah would come and that he would come and that he would overthrow the Caesars and that he would establish a new power and that the Jews would be in charge and that he would come and that he would overthrow them so that they were no longer treated the way they were treated and they would be the ones that were in charge. But you know, 
Michelle and I went to Israel a year ago, and, and I learned something that's, that's pretty shocking to me. One of the most famous places in Israel, if you ever want to go, those of you who've never been there, you've heard about it, it's a wall at which the Jews pray for the Messiah to come. What's that wall called? The Wailing Wall. I think I showed you a video of that that I videoed when I was there a year ago. And people go to this temple, which used to be the original temple that got destroyed, and they rebuilt it. But there's a base wall at the bottom of the old rubbles, and they go there, and they tie a little, like, like it looks like a receipt that you were to roll up tightly, and they put it in the walls, and they put prayers there. And while they're putting those prayers there, they're praying, and if you hear them, they're not just praying, they're wailing. It's like, ah, 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 like that. Have you ever seen that? And you know who they're wailing for? The Messiah. They're wailing for him to come. Now, you know what's shocking? Jesus is coming down off the Mount of Olives. And he's riding on a donkey. And people are throwing things in front of him saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And do you know how far that is from where they're praying for the Messiah to come? 500 yards. Five football fields away from people that are praying for the Messiah to come. The Messiah came. How, how did they miss it? Like, how can you be praying for something? How can you be asking God for something, to do something in your life, and you're praying, and you're praying, and you're praying, and you're wailing, God changed my child, God changed my husband, God changed these circumstances, God healed my body, all of the things that we wail and pray about, and then miss it when it comes. I believe they missed it the same way we miss it. I believe there's three reasons. Can I share them with you? Number one, because they ex what they expected was not what they experienced. Say that with me. What they was not what they What they expected was a king riding in on a stallion with an army. You know what they got? They got a carpenter from Dusa riding on a donkey with some people from Delcom. That's what they did. They got a carpenter from, from Nazareth. They said, could any good thing come from Nazareth? And a few fishermen. They get a carpenter and a fisherman. What, what they didn't understand is that God was going to do something, but he was going to do something, and they were going to experience something, but it would be something different than they expected. Why? Because God's way are eternal, and our understanding is temporary. They expected him to overthrow Rome, but he was a king that wanted to overthrow the sin in their heart and restore their heart and make it clean and become the king of their heart, not the king of a nation. Now, it's interesting because God lives above time. Say that with me. God lives above time. What do I mean? There's past, present, and future. God lives here. He sees it all at one time. Past, present, and future. And so they are trying to figure it out. Revelations 22, 13 says this, I am the, and the alpha and omega are the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. In other words, I'm A and I'm Z. I am the alpha and I'm the omega, the first and the last, before all and end of all. You, you see, God lives above time. And so when we start thinking of something, here's our plan. Well, we're going to leave here, and then we're going to drive, and we're going to drive through Dusan, and we're going to get an I-10, going to go the back way, pass up Miss Mamie's, and then you're going to love Miss Mamie's. And then you're going to go down, and you're going to get off, and you're going to go through, and you get on the highway right there, and you're going to go by the best stop because that's where the best mood is at the best stop. Don't let the devil lie to you. And then 
you, you're going to go down to Crowley, and then you're going to pass through Crowley, and then you go to Lake Charles, and you go to Lake Charles, you're going to go to Beaumont. From Beaumont, you're going to go to Houston. And from Houston, you're going to drive to San Antonio. And from San Antonio, then you're going to go right, and all the way, ultimately take I-10 all the way down to, to California. But God is the Alpha and the Omega, so he doesn't start in Dusan at Miss Mamie's. He starts in California and works his way back. He, he is the Alpha and the Omega. That means he starts at the very end. And because he does start at the very end, he sees things from a different perspective than you and I. That's why faith is trusting in advance would only make sense in reverse. Faith is trusting in advance would only make sense in reverse. The disciples are writing. Remember, John is writing all this, and he's going, hey, here's what happened. Here's what happened. We didn't understand what was going on, but now looking back on it, but faith is trusting in advance what only makes sense when you look back on it. Here's the second reason why they missed it. Because God uses people and circumstances we would never use to fulfill his purposes. Oh, yeah, he does. How many of you have ever been shocked at some of the people God used? How many of you, you were God, you wouldn't use them? You know why I'm glad you're not God? Half of the people in this room wouldn't be here. You would have killed them on the way driving to church. What's wrong with them? Boom. Come on, rush hour of Verite School Road, Cowley Saloon, and Ambassador Caffrey, you'd have killed half the people. Half of Acadiana would no longer be here if you were God. God uses people and circumstances that we would never use. Can I get real personal? May I? I want to ask your permission. Y'all know that there's two jobs. My job is setting the trap for you, and your job is falling into the trap. I keep doing my job, but you're not cooperating with yours. Can, 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 can I share something with you? Okay. God uses people that we would never use. He used the divorce to bring you here. He used that broken relationship. He used your son's addiction. He used your daughter breaking your heart. He used all of those things to get your attention. He used that job loss. Romans 8, 28 makes it very clear. It says, and the apostle Paul is writing and he says, and we, and we what? You, you know, Paul wrote this and when he says, you know, let me tell you what he knew. He was a part of the elite Sadducees. He was a leader above that. It's called the Sanhedrin. They were the governing Jewish people. And when he gave his life to Christ and he saw him on the Damascus road and he had the vision, he lost all of his place in his religion. He lost all of his family inheritance. He lost all the people that were close to him before. Okay? He gives himself to Jesus and then he becomes a Christian and the Christians are afraid of him. And then this powerful tool was so powerful that when he surrendered to Jesus, you know what ended up happening to him? He got put in prison for half of the rest of his life. And you know what Christians were doing? God, set Paul free. Lose him. And God's going, shut up. I got a job for him. And while he was in prison, you know what he did? He wrote over half of the New Testament. Aren't you glad he stayed in prison? And it's from there he wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let the peace of God rule over your heart and mind through Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that God didn't answer his circumstances in a way that we thought? We thought he ought to be out of prison so he could preach to people. And God kept him there so he could preach to billions for centuries to come. And we know, Paul says, looking back on his life, that God causes Come on, what does it say? Everything to together for what? It works. It doesn't mean it is good. Let me help you. It isn't good that we lost our son Wesley at 20. 
but God's worked it for good. It isn't good that, that you've had children that struggle with addiction. It isn't good that you had that failure before you had to get your marriage and realize the priority of what mattered because you've almost ruined your marriage. That isn't good, but God can take because he works things not from the beginning, but from the end, and he can work it back to where he can work all of those things together that it looks in the end as though it never even happened because of his grace. <laughs> who does he do that for? For those who... Aren't you glad it doesn't say for those who always do what's right? Aren't you glad it doesn't say for those who are perfect? Aren't you glad it doesn't say for those who go to our Savior's church? It's for anyone who loves God. Loves God. And then it goes on, for any who love God and are called according to purpose. You know what his purpose is? Two verses later, it says that you be conformed to the image of Christ, which means God's going to take everything that happens to you, even how painful and heartbreaking and disappointing it might be, or good, and he's going to work it from the back all the way to the front, and it's going to be for your good. It's going to be for your good. How, How many of you like movies of adventure? How many crazy people do we like here that have like scary movies? Okay, you know what? You all like a scary movie. How many of you like an adventure movie that's scary, but it ends good? All that's true unless we're in it. (laughs) Unless we're in it. Like, I like the movie where they lose everything, and they're broken up, and the wife cusses him out, and he's down and despondent, and the kids hate him, and then he comes back as the champion and the hero, and it's all great, and the old people walking through the mall in those thick shoes. (laughs) Yeah, you like all of that, unless it's you. And we know that All things are working together for the good. I just want you to pause a moment. I want you to close your eyes a moment. Lord, today we thank you for all things. For all things. The wonderful things. The things that make us smile. The things that make us sad the things that make us laugh, the things that make us cry. Today, Lord, we thank you for, let's say it together, all things. Okay, look up at me. Number three, the third reason they missed it is because times and seasons are in God's hand alone. God's mystery is revealed in history. (laughs) That's what John's saying. John's saying, looking back on it now, now I understand what he was saying. Now I understand what he meant. Now I know why that she spread all of this ointment all over. Now I can look back and now I see all the why behind the what. Remember I told you faith is trusting in advance would only make sense in reverse. If I could get the piano player to come right now. God's mystery is revealed in history. When when God identifies himself, like before God told anybody his name, like like when, when he called Moses out of a burning bush, Moses said, all right, you want me to go back to Egypt, the place that I left, to my grandfather who ran me off because I killed somebody? And you want me to go back because I understand the language, the culture, the customs, all of the different traditions that are in the palace. You want me to go back? Okay, who do I tell him sent me? And he said, he said, like, do you have a last name? And he said, that I am. Could you repeat that again? I am. That. But three chapters later, in, in chapter three, he says, I am the God of Abraham and Okay, y- y- y'all read the Bible over here in this section? <laughs> like, y- y'all like <laughs> Boudreau and Thibodeau. And, okay. I am the God of Amen. and, and, 
Okay, y- y'all are the Jacob. I mean, y'all, y'all are making me feel real bad about myself right here. Okay, we're going to try it one more time. Y'all are Jacob. Just remember that. That's me, okay? God of and and thank you very much. I appreciate the love. But why would God identify himself by people? Like, like, why would God say, if you want to know who I am, I'm, I'm Dylan's God. I'm Don's God. I'm, I'm, I'm Talinda's God. I'm, I'm Rochelle's God. I'm Miss Michelle's God. I'm, I'm your mama's God. I'm, well, he gives us three names, and the first one is who? Abraham. Abraham. Now, what is unique about Abraham that we remember? Come on, man, you know. What's unique about him? When did he have a son? Come on, man, don't get shy on me. This is pre-blue pill. He had a son at 99. He got his wife pregnant and at 100. Come on, what you think he was like when he walked through the gym in reds? He just stopped and went, y'all know? <laughs> He, he didn't walk in. Jimmy, he just walked in and went, y'all know? Okay? L- listen. You know what that means? That he can take someone who's man should be physically dead. A woman should be physically dead. And he can take that which is dead and create the impossible. He's the God of the impossible. He is the God of the he is the God of the, he is the God of the, he is the God of the, he says to you, I am the God of the impossible. I don't care where your husband is, where your daughter is, where your situation is. I am the God of the impossible. I'm the God of the impossible. I got the free songs. And then he says, I'm the God of Abraham and I'm the God of, and now, now Isaac, Isaac, was whose son? Abraham. That, that was that son that was born at 100. Okay, do you think he was famous in preschool? And your grandpa brought you? <laughs> and your great grandfather out there? <laughs> he was wearing them t shirts. I'm Isaac's daddy. <laughs> holla, holla, holla. <laughs> I'm I. I'm Isaac. And, and the story that we know about him that is so famous is not only his birth, but, but how he almost died. Because his daddy would go up with him and they would go sacrifice to the Lord on the Mount Moriah. And they, they, they would do it every year and they would go and they would sacrifice an animal. And now he's a little older, probably in his teens somewhere. I think he was probably about 14 because I've always wanted to kill every one of my children when I got about 14. And, and, and he's carrying all the wood and they're going up Mount Moriah and he looks over to daddy and goes, daddy, 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 we got, we got the wood. Daddy, daddy, we got the fire. But daddy, we didn't bring a sacrifice. We always bring a sacrifice. Where's the sacrifice? And he looks at him and he says, the Lord will provide for himself a sacrifice. And then we get up and, and, and then he, they, they build they build the altar. They'd done it before. He'd been right beside his daddy all along. But then his daddy started looking kind of weird. Kind of has a different look in his eyes never seen before. Remember, we're hearing this story now from Isaac's perspective, not Abraham's. He looks at him and goes, Daddy, why are you looking at me that way, Daddy? You're kind of crazy. You've been smoking something? Daddy, what is that? He says, son, lay, lay on the altar. Are you sure, Daddy? He lays on the altar. Yeah, why, why are you tying me up, Dad? Like, is this like a game? And he ties him up, and he pulls out the knife, and he stands over him. Daddy, what are you doing? What are you doing? This is crazy. And then he hears the voice of God. God 
says, Abram, now I know that you love me more than what I've given to you. And he looks over, and there is a goat. And his horns are ram, his horns are got caught in a thicket. And Abram looses his son. I know he was mad at him. Let me tell you something, that brother <laughs> Isaac jumped on that ram. <laughs> And he drags him over, and the Bible says he names that place, not God. He names that place Jehovah Jireh. You know what that place was called a couple thousand years later? Golgotha, the same place. And do you know who was sacrificed on that hill? The Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. His obedience gave a clear picture to the Jews who the Messiah would be. It would make it without excuse. Can, can you imagine Isaac telling that story to his kids? Now, I'll tell you about the time my daddy wanted to kill me. Look, look at me. That meant the God who raises the dead. He was not only the God that does the impossible. He is the God that raises. He is the God that raises. He is the God that raises. The God that raises the dead. And then he said, I'm the God of Abraham, I'm the God of Isaac, and I'm the God of... And you know what was interesting about Jacob? J Jacob, Jacob was a deceiver. Jacob was a liar and manipulator until he had an encounter with an angel and the angel wrestled with him daybreak was coming and Jacob said I I'm not going to let you go the angel said let me go he said I'm not going to let you go he said let me go he said I'm not going to let you go until you bless me and he said okay your name's not Jacob anymore get a new passport and a driver's license your name now is Israel, which means a prince with God, not a deceiver, a prince with God. So you know what God does? Look right here. God is committed to sending circumstances in your life that you think are wrestling, that he divinely sends there as angelic gifts to fight for you, to change you, to become what you've always desired to be, but never could on your own. couldn't do it on your own. He's committed to sending angels to fight with you. He's committed to sending angels to fight on your behalf to help you become all that he created and called you to be. Pastor, how, how, how do I do that? How do I do that? In the last minute and a half, I'm going to tell you, number one, trust Trust who he is because he's working from the end all the way back to the beginning. Just trust who he is. You can't always trust what you see. Trust who he is. Trust who he is. You say, Pastor, but I don't have what I want. Look at me. He's what you want. He's what you want. Here's the second thing. Wait. Say with me, wait. He never asks us to be anything that he's not himself. How many have ever been called Ted Doer? You ever been called Ted Doer? Raise your hand. What does Ted Doer mean? How many of you have ever been called hard headed? Raise your hand. Come on. Okay. Look at me. Look at me. You know what I love so much about God besides his love? Like, like if I'm waiting for you. All right, you tell me you're going to be here, like I'm going to be there at 1130. Like 1145, I'm looking at my clock. 1150, I'm gone. Close friend, 12 o'clock, 1215, I'm Mexican, hasta la vista. Look at me.
ever and ever. And then when we stop and we finally get it, he didn't look at us and go, well, I've been waiting for 32 years, moron. While you was running through La Fonda's Cowboys, the strip, nasty Nicky, drunk Donald, all their cousins. Look at me. But he says, I've been waiting. I've been waiting. I love you. And it's act like he just started waiting just now. Like he just started just now. the final thing. Oh, bang. I was talking to someone in a marital crisis the other day and they said to me, I said, go back to your wife, humble yourself, apologize, take responsibility for your marriage. Okay? God left one person in charge of your marriage. It's you. When Eve blew it in the garden, God didn't come looking for Adam. I mean, looking for Eve, he came looking for Adam. You're in charge. Humble yourself. Go home, put on a flak jacket and a cup. Every one of you play sports, you know what I'm talking about. Just go back and humble yourself. Humble yourself. He called me a little later and goes, Pastor, I, I did what you told me to do and it didn't work. You know, that's really kind of the generation we live in, huh? If A plus B doesn't equal C, then it doesn't work. Let's try something else. Let me share something with you about the Word of God. Look at me. I I have a love and hate relationship with my alarm clock. How many of you have a love-hate relationship with your alarm clock? Okay. This is kind of a little psychological test for you. It's going to save you a little counseling right now. Okay. How many of you here set your alarm for way before you're supposed to get up and you just hit snooze, 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 snooze until you get up. Raise your hand. Okay, can I share something with you? Every time you wake up and turn it off, you lose sleep. So if you want to get more sleep, set it for the time you want to get up and get up. Every person here, when I say pray or waiting, attached to that, that clock, when I say that, that's a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a loved one, a circumstance. But I want you to imagine if a clock was attached to that and had a time and a calendar. Because every one of them do. And if you don't quit, it keeps ticking. I wish I knew the answer. I wish I could come to you and go, hey, he's drunk Donald now, but he's going to be Don the Baptist here in six months. Don't worry. Hey, I know she's running crazy, acting a fool right now. She's nasty Nikki now. She's going to be holy holly in a month. Okay, I know that I wish I could go and I could tell you when all of those things are going to happen, but I can tell you some of mine have taken 17 years. Some of mine have taken 20 years, but what did I have in the meantime? I had him and his word that are unwavering. Because I think sometimes if God gives us what we want, it's kind of like our children, we go into the next thing we want except it really matters, which is it. That's why no matter what experience you have, as soon as you think you're going to get it, it's going to fulfill you. You get it, and it doesn't. And 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 at the end, he's still waiting there all along for you. Look at me. Our Father's relentless. His love for you is relentless. But his word is unwavering. And I trust and I wait and I obey because if he told me to do it it doesn't matter what it looks like now it will all work out for my good in the end would you bow your head with me right now I want everyone to put your palms or your hands out on your lap 
Father, each one of our hands represent a prayer that we prayed. It might be our children, our grandchildren, our sons, our daughters. It might be a loved one, a neighbor. It might be our mate. It might be a health situation or financial situation. None of them are hidden from you. You're the Alpha and the Omega. So many times we miss watching you because what we expected and what we experienced don't match up. Thank you, Father. It's you. It, it's you. It's, it's you that fills us. It's you that keeps us. It's you that we need and long for more than anything in the world. It's you. Today, we trust you. Just say that with me. I trust you, God. Come on, one more time. I trust you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask you the most important question of your life. Jesus said, unless a man or woman was born again, they wouldn't see the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, unless a man or woman was born again, they wouldn't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Have you been born again? You say, Pastor, what does that mean? I've been christened. I've been baptized. I've joined the church. Isn't that good enough? That's a great start, but that's not what Jesus said. You see, every person born since Adam and Eve has been born spiritually dead. God is a spirit, and you can't know him or his love until you become spiritually alive. I used to tell people, stop running from God. I've now realized God's been running after us. All we've got to do is stop running. Today, have you been born again? Jesus said to be born again. Unless you are, you won't see the kingdom or enter the kingdom, meaning you can't know God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and you say, Pastor, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I may have been christened, baptized, or even joined the church, but I've never been born again. It only happens once, just like the day you were born. If you're here and you say, Pastor, I, I want to pray to be born again today. I've never prayed to prayer to know God to be born again. If that's what Jesus said I need to do in John 3, that's what I want to do. When I count to three, when I get to three, I want you to raise your hand. I'm just going to pray for you right at your seat for you to be born again today. One, God brought you here. Oh, yeah, it was him. He used somebody, he used circumstance, he used some pain, but it was him. Two, he's been waiting and waiting and waiting. And now it's your time. Stop running from love. Stop running from the one who you were made for. that's what you desire when I say three you raise your hand three raise your hand high if you want to be born again one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen nineteen twenty twenty one twenty two twenty three twenty four twenty five twenty six twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine thirty thirty one thirty two thirty three thirty four thirty five thirty six thirty seven thirty eight thirty nine forty forty one Um, look up at me a moment. Some of you may have seen this. I put this on our social media. It was a young girl, and she said this. When God wanted fish, he spoke to the water, because that's where fish live, and they came. When God wanted trees, he spoke to the ground, because that's where trees live, and came. But when God wanted to make a man, he spoke to himself and said, let us make man in our own image. Why? Because we were made to live in God. And when we don't, we die. Today, many people pray to be born again today. Over the course of Easter, let's believe God for hundreds and hundreds of your friends and loved ones to come to know Him. 
Bow your head. Let's pray out loud together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my guilt, my sin, and my shame, and you died for it. I believe you faced hell for me so I would not have to go. And you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn away from sin to be born again. Today, God is my Father, Jesus is my Savior, and I'm born again in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand up on your feet with me? Hey, if you just made that decision to give your life to Jesus, your next step is water baptism. You can find one of these cards right in front of you. Grab that, fill that out, and you leave it right on your seat. Hey, just a reminder, next week, Easter, grab a card, invite somebody. We have prayer partners up at the front. You are dismissed, and we'll see you next week.